Hello Vinyl Community. So I was thinking about making another video. I haven't done one in a while and um, so uh, another chance to exercise a little bit of my broken English. Um, of course at your costs if you are listening to this. <laughs> so um, I thought I will um, dedicate this video to one of my favorite bands. So I will be focused only on one project. Now this is um, certainly one of my all-time favorite bands, but if we are talking about the realm of ambient music, they are certainly uh, my top act, operating in the same uh, range as uh, Brian Eno or John Hassel. Um, so um, let's get on with it. Um, the band I'm talking about is, of course, O Yukai Conjugate, but you probably guessed that from the title of this video. Now, before I start showing some albums, there's a couple of things that need to be clarified. First of all, there are at least a half a dozen choices how to create a uh, coherent uh, Oyukai Conjugate chronology in terms of albums. And um, once you look closer, it kind of becomes a bit complicated. Um, the other thing is that um, actually I will not say a lot about the band itself. I mean the people behind it for one simple reason. There probably never was any other band in the world that has kept such a massive low profile. Basically hiding uh, behind the music and uh, the albums, uh, the LPs, the CDs in question. Which is quite fascinating in itself, wouldn't you say? Um, this is probably the one band that is the very definition of low profile. And um, yeah, there are some famous acts in the world, bands like, let's say, Pink Floyd, that tried very hard to be low profile and, of course, completely failed at it. Um, Especially someone like Pink Floyd is basically a cult of personalities. <laughs> and so uh, this here is an interesting case of a band that has quite managed uh, to achieve that. Well, I assume that it has always been uh, a an, uh, an real objective of these musicians um, to kind of remain in the dark. Uh, so you as the listener get basically confronted with the music only. And uh, so it's, it has always been a bit complicated to uh, find out which one of these musicians uh, is playing a particular instrument. Uh, they never really wrote it on the, on the albums. Um, you only see the names on the albums. Uh, and in another paragraph you may see a list of the instruments that have been used, but uh, you hardly ever see any connections created between the instruments and the people. It's all quite fascinating. There is also this old Oyukai conjugate tradition to use only family names on uh, in the personal section on the albums and to abbreviate uh, the first name only to a um, initial. And um, I will break with that tradition a little bit here when I uh, talk about the albums in question. Yeah, so uh, this is a fascinating band um, that uh, now exists for at least 30 years, actually. And uh, they come from, well, mostly from north of England. But a large part of their work has been created in London, for example. And um, yeah, so um, when I talk about a chronology, so it's, it's basically my individual chronology. It's my personal chronology as I regard it. And... Uh, you could sort uh, a lot of these uh, CDs and albums in a different order. Also, it's not a very important point, right? So there's one more thing that comes to mind when I talk about this wonderful band. Um, in the 80s, they produced two uh, albums and one... Uh, sort of a experimental visual presentation that came out on a VHS tape. And I, I don't have any of those three... Uh, uh, well, actually I do have them, but I get to that later. <laughs> that's, that's what I meant when I said that it's a bit complicated with this band. So um, the thing is, 
their first album was called Scene in Mirage and came out in 1984. And you can go on Discogs or anywhere you like and you can basically get it if you are a collector of vinyl. It's still available by sort of second-hand sellers. But I never bought it because, um, honestly, um, I really, uh, I'm really fed up with people demanding these horrendous amounts of money for, for albums from the 80s or 90s. Um, if, if I knew, I mean, you can buy it for 80 dollars or 120 euro and sometimes I see it for 160, stuff like that. And yeah, most of us can somehow take a credit card and pay this kind of money. And if I knew that this album somewhere lies in the um, in the private collection of one of these artists and he's selling it for that amount, I would probably see the reason in that. But do I want to throw 130 euro into the throat of some asshole of a record seller that just kind of squeezes money out of this whole thing? No, really not. I'm kind of done with that shit. And um, so uh, if I would... It, if I would see that album somewhere for 45 or 50 dollar, I would probably buy it. But um, um, just for kicks, just to have it in my collection. Now I do have it, as I said, but in a reissue. I get to that later. Um, but uh, I just, I just wanted to mention that because uh, sometimes, if you are buying records like me for so many years. Uh, you can easily get disgusted by some of these demands, especially because uh, you can you can call everything rare. It's not really rare because whenever you look into Discogs, there's like a dozen people selling it. So if they are all selling it, it's obviously not rare. Rare is when somebody comes with a seven inch by Elvis that exists only in thousand copies because it was printed somewhere in 1955. And uh, then you can say, yeah, this is rare. I want thousand dollars for that. I can understand that. But um, this material is still floating around. And so I think the prices should be a little more reasonable, especially regarding the fact that not a cent out of these transfers goes in any way to the artist. I mean, when they sold this album 30 years ago, they probably asked like, I don't know, nine dollars for that or or six pounds or whatever. So um, I'm just not willing to support every level of this whole uh, uh, rarity, vinyl sale, shabbiness that is around me all the time. So Enough about that, uh, let's get to the real business. So, in my highly subjective and personal chronology, um, the story of this band starts with this album, which is called Primitive. Now, Primitive came out, um, well, actually it came out in 1996, so at this point uh, they have been a very well-known and established act. So Primitive is a is a compilation and as a compilation it is focused on their work in the 1980s. So basically stuff they recorded uh, in the very early uh, phase of their existence. And uh, it's a wonderful album. A large portion of these tracks uh, recapitulates uh, the music they have been doing on uh, Scene in Mirage on their very early uh, record. And uh, also it includes uh, five unreleased tracks on it. So in a sense it's also a lot of new material. But it covers a certain particular period uh, in their history. Between 1983 and 1987 uh, before the release of Undercurrents. So this is a great CD just to get into the early work. And, uh, and to listen to those very early ambient tracks. So um, this is a very quiet and very fascinating music, um, sometimes uh, a little more experimental than some of their later albums. Um, but still you already, you already hear and feel uh, this very typical organic Oyukai conjugate sound. Um, so it's a great CD. I really liked it when this came out, because at this point in time uh, their very early music was not so easy to get, I'm talking like mid 90s, late 90s, and um, this was sort of pre internet. So, this came out in a limited edition of 2000, and it's a good starting point uh, for their early music. Now, uh, the next album 
you know, the next album I want to show you came out in 1991 and it's called Peyote. Now when Oyukai Conjugate stepped sort of out of the dark of a complete underground act into this uh, status as a internationally well-known uh, ambient project, um, those were the years when CD started to become the the prime medium for music and uh, they quite embraced the CD I would say in creating uh, very long albums that completely filled uh, the, the available uh, space on a CD disc so uh, all this stuff does not exist on vinyl if you would put it on vinyl you would have to create double albums all the time um, so um, yeah, now Peyote was a really an interesting step to a particular direction. This was the only time that they worked with a huge uh, number of uh, guest musicians and uh, a lot of percussionists. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, there's a strong feel of African and Asian uh, uh, music uh, lying beneath those acoustic layers. Yeah, talking about ambient albums always kind of is a temptation to ramble, <laughs> isn't that right? <laughs> so this is a wonderful sounding album um, and probably the one album they made that uh, could be regarded closest to this genre term called world music. I usually don't use this term world music because I think it's a bit silly. But um, there is this kind of a feel, so um, there is also this feel of uh, fourth world in terms of John Hassel and Brian Eno. Um, so this is a this is really this is a really great uh, sort of organic ambient album uh, with amazing uh, trance-like uh, percussion passages, and um, I always love the cover design. So it's very ambiguous and at the same time very atmospheric. Uh, the album, the CD, came out on the Swedish label Multimood. So I bought it when this came out in 1991. And um, I mean, this for months, this has hardly left my CD player back in the day. A very fascinating album. Yeah, uh, very cannabis oriented, I would say. <laughs> I don't think that's a wrong. I don't think that is a wrong assumption. I think. Uh, uh, around the world, uh, a lot of J's had been lit up to this album. Now the next album, we, we are now at 1992, is uh, Undercurrents in Dark Water. Now this is in a sense a reissue of their second vinyl album they brought out in, I think, 1987 maybe. And, um, 86 actually. And, uh, but... This is uh, sort of an upgrade by adding, uh, by recording new material. So on this CD you find the original album from 1986, but the tracks 10 to 13 are completely new recordings uh, that were made in 1992, um, which is a great idea. I think it's, it beautifully enriches uh, the album by adding material that sort of comes from their prime time as a band um, so um, this is a wonderful CD very long and full of amazing uh, atmospheric ideas and um, yeah it's, it's one of the true milestones of sort of the ambient fourth world music history so um, this album uh, came out on Stahlblatt in the Netherlands a famous underground label and uh, um, this is the first edition. Only a small amount of those uh, came out with this sort of holographic uh, postcard uh, kind of a motif on the cover that changes while you move the CD cover. Um, I don't know if you can see it on camera. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, well, you have to believe it. <laughs> so, uh, great album. A true classic uh, example of uh, slightly dark, uh, atmospheric, organic, ambient music. Um, now, up until this point, there was a sort of a, yeah, well, classic lineup, you could say, in Oyukai Conjugate, which is, of course, uh, Andrew Holm and uh, Claire Elliott playing flute, and Roger and Tim Horbury. 
So that is the lineup that existed throughout the 80s and at the beginning of the 90s. Um, but then suddenly interesting changes started to occur. Now that leads us to the year 1995 when this album arrived, Equator. Um, I'm probably not the only one saying that, but for many this seems like a pinnacle of uh, sorts. Uh, certainly a, a great high point and uh, some would say their best album. Um, yeah, it strongly continues the style of peyote and undercurrents, certainly. Um, interestingly, only two members of this before mentioned original lineup are on this year, Andrew Holm and uh, Roger Horbury. And uh, there's a suddenly this whole range of uh, new musicians appearing there. So there is uh, Daniel Mudford, uh, I think, playing maybe guitar of sorts, uh, but mostly probably something uh, rather tape or, or keyboard like. Uh, well, I'm peeking all the time from my charts here. Because, as I said, this is quite complicated. So, um, yeah, as I said, uh, Daniel Mudford is pl playing on this album. And uh, Peter Woodhead, um, who uh, is, I think, um, also uh, so part of the, of the experimental aspects uh, of this album. Maybe. I mean, I think he added some vocals to this here. Now, this is all very mysterious because you... I mean, the, the, the descriptions on the CD never really guides you to the individual uh, artists in question. Um, yeah, there is, for the first time, Joe Gardiner on it playing a soprano saxophone, but um, do not imagine this as a saxophone. I mean, it sounds as a saxophone in the same sense as, uh, well, uh, John Hassel is a trumpet player and yet uh, it's not uh, the way a uh, trumpet usually sounds. So here you you see a, a saxophone incorporated in a very similar and very uh, twisted and distorted way. It's quite fascinating. And yeah, you have uh, you have Rob Jenkins for the first time on this album. Um, he will later become a rather important uh, member of this project. You have a Malcolm McGeorge on it, who is a rather rare guest, I think, uh, and uh, interestingly Paul Schütze, um, who co-produced this album. Um, so this is quite interesting. I mean, this is a uh, progressive artist uh, in his own right, and uh, he probably strongly contributed uh, to this uh, great uh, atmospheric uh, sound of this album. Now, I must be careful not to use the word atmospheric too much in this video, uh, so I will try to <laughs> keep it <laughs> low key. So this is Equator, um, great classic Oyukai conjugate album, um, but certainly the last album they produced in this particular era, in this uh, part of their history, um, that is uh, signified by these three LPs, uh, Peyote, Undercurrents and Equator. From now on things get even more complicated and more checkered. So, uh, yeah, in the same year um, an interesting CD came out titled Sun Chemical. Now this is um, Oyukai Conjugate going the path of, uh, of a remix album. And um, this is actually quite beautiful. Um, Oftentimes, I'm not a big fan of remix albums. It seems to me like uh, the remixes hardly ever add anything interesting uh, to the original material. So it's either butchered or daft and boring. But this is one of those cases where a remix album is truly beautiful. Um, so uh, it's basically uh, the track Sun Chemical from the Equator album um, worked over in six different cases. Now that doesn't mean that you get to hear six times uh, the same track uh, just with a little bit uh, house drums <laughs> added to it. I mean these th six tracks uh, are in, in most parts quite unrecognizable to the original material and uh, uh, if, you, if you wouldn't know you wouldn't uh, realize that it's uh, it, those are the remix of the same uh, music. Um, 
yeah, I mean, if you want to dip into this, uh, check out the track uh, Californium, which was remixed by Charles Webster. It's one of the coolest, it's one of the coolest um, sort of electro uh, or techno tracks you can imagine. True masterpiece. Um, uh, I've hardly ever met anyone, anyone who did not like Californium. It's quite amazing. But uh, the whole album is quite fun. I mean, it's not an, it's not an, it's not an aggressive uh, kind of house or electro or uh, techno music. Uh, it's more um, laid back. Uh, so the sound is very relaxed. And at the very beginning, it has the most uh, amazing uh, concert announcer that you can imagine. And uh, yeah, that's it. Cool album. Um, kind of a different path for one album uh, for this band, uh, but um, highly recommendable. But for a while this was it. We didn't know that at the time, but for quite a long time uh, there shouldn't be any other studio album by Oyukai Conjugate. Imagine that. So next year no new album came out, but it saw the birth of Fell. Now Fell is a uh, collaboration project between Paul Schütze and Andrew Hall. And uh, yeah, what they released is uh, this beautifully designed uh, album um, that came on CD. It sort of comes signed and hand numbered. And uh, I mean the whole the whole digi pack is uh, quite nicely done. Uh, you can open it and take this part out. Um, now, as far as the sound goes, um, I must confess, when I uh, bought this um, and listened to it, at first I was a little bit disappointed because um, there was a natural expectation to, to, to hear some kind of a acoustic uh, continuation to Equator. And uh, I don't know why, I guess that's just uh, those are the natural human desires to, to, to encounter repetition of something you have liked before. But um, of course, uh, there's always a mistake that fans do. And uh, this is a bit of a different animal, this album. Um, it's much more experimental, uh, it's much more in the, in the direction of musique concrète maybe and industrial. It has still uh, long uh, passages and layers that are very, very ambient -y, um, But um, this is the kind of album you probably like to acquire if you, if you are into progressive experimental music uh, with a lot of uh, sort of tape treatments and samples and um, yeah so it's it's quite a fascinating one and um, I do listen to it from time to time it has very interesting tracks on it uh, but it's certainly it's not an ambient album uh, that would be very wrong to say um, because in parts it can be a little challenging and if there's one thing you can say about ambient then it's not supposed to be challenging <laughs> you know what I mean so, uh, this was 1996. 1997 um, saw uh, another Oyukai Conjugate related release. And I'm talking about uh, Oyukai Conjugate and the Sons of Silence and their album Spoke. Now, this is a live album. Now, uh, the only uh, sort of a conventional live album with Oyukai Conjugate involved. Um, it is a um, concert made in the city of uh, Nevers, which is close to Paris. Um, it was a recording in... Uh, let me look this up. This was a... Oh yeah, this was on June 1996. And that's basically Andrew Holm and the three new guys that had appeared in, during the Equator sessions. Um, talking about uh, Daniel Mudford, Peter Woodhead and uh, Joe Gardiner. And um, um, so uh, at this point, only Andrew Holm is the only sort of original lineup member um, here. Um, this is a very this is a very calm, ambient performance. Certainly, uh, very very interesting tracks, uh, very sort of experimental. Um, so it's a good it's a good live album. 
Now this is the normal release as it came out back in the day. There was also another edition which was a little more bombastic, uh, sort of a limited edition version of it. Um, but that I never got. Um, kind of never came around to acquire it. Now the whole the whole moniker thing uh, here is quite interesting because uh, since um, the um, the lineup was so radically changed from the previous albums, um, this kind of a new group of musicians uh, called themselves also the Sons of Silence and uh, they made a whole range of CDs for example this one this is a sort of a maxi CD they put out and the sound is very much different this is sort of a left field uh, um, yeah I've actually never really figured out in what kind of uh, how to label that and there are all kind of interesting sounds and all kind of interesting uh, music out there that just don't need a particular label um, so it's somewhere in the world of uh, rhythmic music of electronic music of, uh, of uh, uh, of sort of a new jazz slash house, uh, whatever you like. So uh, it's it's quite a strong deviation from the Oyukai conjugate sound uh, that you that we are talking about here, and um, obviously something the guys needed to get out of their system. So at this point in time, uh, the band already existed for over almost twelve years, I think, and. Uh, it surely started to feel like their time is over. And uh, the before mentioned uh, primitive compilation came out that kind of covered their 80s, their mid 80s uh, music. Um, so that's it. But not really. I mean, there is a kind of a second chapter to this whole story. And um, there's an interesting uh, object uh, in between.